little bit better every year. I think the questions are getting more and more pointed and poignant. Um, and I think it's, we've challenged the, uh, the candidates to really dig down deep and so we can figure out what they're going to do for our town. Um, this is really an important night to me because uh, we have sometimes a difficult time getting people in Van Alstine to um, join some of the things that we've got going on downtown or you know whether we're having a downtown jam or whatever it is. But this is the night that's really, really important to me. If you look around at each other, this is, this is the group that is going to really lead Van Alstine. I mean, this is the group that cares enough to come in and learn what, what their candidates have to say. And they care enough to come in to, so that they can vote to help steer this town in the direction they want it to go instead of just sitting back saying, somebody will do it. Um, it's, it's really good, you ought to really give each other a, a hand for showing up here tonight and taking, taking part in this. Um, we've got uh, MJ Presley's going to run the timer tonight, again, as per usual. Uh, we have Stephanie Cheritonenko. I knew I was going to miss it, but there, I made up for it. I'll say it twice, Cheritonenko. Uh, we wanted to get some of the rules um, straightened out before we even start. We're going to do what we've done in the past, and you're going to each... Each of the candidates will have about three minutes to give a little brief bio or history about themselves or why they think they want to run for this position or what it is you think you can do for the city. Pretty much you can talk about blueberry wine if that's what you want to do, but it'll be completely wasted of time. This is a good opportunity for you to help people you know, get to know you and what your positions are. Uh, again, we're not going to allow, I don't think we have that problem too much these days, but we're not going to allow any pointing, at, pointing fingers at anyone or talking directly about another candidate. You address the, the questions that are asked of you, and that's it. You can't say, well, Steve said this, and Jimmy said this, or we won't be putting up with that. You'll have two minutes to answer a question. And when MJ gives a signal, if you're not done by two minutes, <coughs> the guy goes ape. <laughs> really, you, do, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go beyond two minutes. Because MJ jumps up on the table and just, it's something we really want to avoid. So just so that you know that. Um, I think it's going to be a good evening. I've got the questions. Some of you have submitted questions. I'm going to go through them. We have a couple of people that are going to go through them. And we're going to put them in order that we can answer as many as we can tonight so we don't have a whole lot of time to look at these. So in, a, in, a, in an effort to waste a little time, I'm going to introduce you to our mayor. <laughs> and I'm joking, of course. Ms. Kim DeMasters is here, and I would like her to address the audience while we go and kind of read over these questions. Thanks. Do I need to moderate already? <laughs> I love to be announced as a waste of time. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm Kim DeMasters. Most of you know who I am. I was elected last May, and it's been an amazing ride for me. Um, one of the things that I'd like to bring to your attention is that um, we have um, kind of come up with the slogan, Van Alstine Vote Community 2012. And um, if you would like one of these posters, we've got plenty of them to put in your business window or if you want to put one in your car window. We've got some, some great things that have been happening in Van Alstine in the last year. As most of you know, we um, lost our last city manager. We had an interim for six months. <coughs> That was kind of a crazy time. Um, we have a new city manager, Phil Rodriguez, who has done an amazing job. He's taken us um, leaps and bounds in the last six months. Well, five months, I guess. And um, I, I'm sorry to say he's not here not He's in a training. But if you can, some of the positive things that have happened since he's been here, if you can drive by most of our parks, 
our parks are amazing right now and um, he's updated our codes to where the um, new businesses that are coming to town or ordinances new business it makes it a whole lot easier for new businesses to come to town to get permits for residents that are coming to town to pay for their permits he's just done some amazing things not just him but I mean the council with him in you know as the leadership and um, I just would love to if you haven't met him take the time to go down to to the city hall and meet him. We've had some staff changes that have been really good. Our city um, police department has changed a little bit. Our fire department has changed slightly. And some amazing things are happening right now. It's it's really important and I think I, I thank these gentlemen and lady here because it takes a lot of um, self-assuredness to run for a position it takes a lot of time and it's a very thankless job and you know I keep telling City Hall that they've got my address wrong because I haven't got my paycheck yet <laughs> <laughs> that big fat paycheck that I'm supposed to get every month I just haven't got it yet so I keep telling them they've got the wrong address but anyways I just I just commend these gentlemen and this lady for running for this position because it takes a lot of time and a lot of um, gumption to do what they are out here to do. They are your voice. You guys need to take the time to visit with them, get to know them, find out who they are, what they represent, and make an educated vote because they're, your, they're gonna be your voice for the next two years. And you guys really need to take the time to get to know them. And I thank you guys for taking the time to be here this evening. I just uh, really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And Stephanie? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you also to the Chamber of Commerce for having me come here to serve as moderator for the Meet the Candidate Night. It's a pleasure to be back in Van Alstine after being away for about a year. I'm just a little south in Fairview. We have a lot to go through, and I think we um, went through the rules pretty quickly. We're going to have each of the candidates introduce themselves for three minutes each. We're going to go in alphabetical order, so there's no preference. And then we, after the introductions, we will have uh, a series of questions. I don't want to waste too much time because even with uh, the time going to 8.30, we will only have around time for about eight questions, so for that reason, we need to keep the responses to two minutes each, and we will go alphabetically for those as well, um, in an order uh, where everyone gets the, the, a question at least first and, and has the time also to answer the question last. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and have the candidates introduce themselves. And we'll start with Mr. Jennings. Okay. You have three minutes. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank each of you for being here, and uh, I'd like to thank the chamber for hosting us this evening. Uh, it may be hard to fill three minutes, but I'll try. Uh, I've been a resident of Van Alstine since 2005. I uh, moved here to be near our son and my wife. I've been married for 38 years to Becky in the back. We <laughs> moved here for her to be a babysitter for grandchildren. So I uh, have one son, uh, he resides here also, and all three grandchildren are in the Van Alton School District. Uh, they pretty much are our life now. <clears throat> Just hold it, okay. Uh, a little bit about me. I moved here in 1986 to the Texoma area. I lived in Pottsboro for about 18 years before moving to Van Alstine. John. Yes. Okay. Moved here in, in uh, 2005. I came here in 1986 and lived in Pottsboro for about 15, 17 years. Uh, I'm a Vietnam era U.S. Navy veteran, served in the Navy, honorably discharged. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in Management. I have uh, 30 years experience, so just over 30 years experience in industrial maintenance, 
and facilities management. Uh, I was raised in a small farming community in the Panhandle, Texas, so fully understand small town heritage and that. Uh, found an interest in, in city, wanted to, to help the city when I got to Van Austin and began, began watching growth to the south and wondered a little bit about why Van Austin didn't seem to be growing. I uh, wanted to get involved more with that and see if we could help, I could help the city going in a positive direction. And that's about it for now. Okay. My name is Robert Lewis. I want to thank you all for having me here tonight. Uh, I moved to Van Austin 40 years ago. I married my wife of 38 years. Uh, we've raised three sons in Van Austin. They all still reside in Van Austin. My grandkids go to Van Austin ISD. I, in 77, I started a construction company in this town. And uh, <clears throat> one day I was working and I kept hearing this siren go off and I went to find out what it was and it was the fire department looking for firemen. I spent 28 years with the fire department, volunteered in two years of pay. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoy the city of Van Austin. Uh, I was instrumental in getting the ambulance service established you know, for the city of Van Austin and make it a combination paid and volunteer fire department. I was also instrumental in adding the living quarters and everything to the back of the fire station along with the police department that we have at no expense to the city of Van Austin. So you can tell that I fairly enjoy the city of Van Austin and I want to see Van Austin move forwards and prosper. Uh, everybody's going to holler, well, can you fix my street? That's, that's the key factor to Van Austin, can you fix my street? You know, yes, eventually your streets will be fixed, okay? But it's going to take everybody working together. And uh, I want to see Van Austin prosper and how uh, what some of these other cities has, so it'll be easier for us to fix streets. And I hope uh, by being a candidate and being able to serve the city that maybe I can help make that possible. Thank you. Okay, my name is Jim Smith. I'm running as the incumbent for the Van Alstine City Council Place 2. Two years ago, when I made the decision to run for City Council, I found a spot in my mind of the future for Van Alstine. I looked down the road to where Van Alstine needed to be in, in 10 years. I haven't, I, I, I adjusted my thinking, mainly because of citizens' comments and concerns and their, and their comments to me, but my course has stayed the same. I haven't flip-flopped I still have a vision for where Van Alstine needs to be, and it's not a quick fix. It's going to take 10 years, and I've dedicated that in my mind to the city of Van Alstine as long as the citizens will have me and there's a need for me and I have the health to do it. During the time I've been on the city council, I've seen a lot of people talk about the past, and I'm very respectful of the past. I enjoy listening to the stories of the past of Van Alstine. And I enjoy talking to what I call my, my uh, advisors that drink coffee over at the drugstore every morning as my, my historical advisors. <coughs> and I treasure those, those comments in that time. But you can't plan for the future if you're living in the past. When you go to bed at night, you have a reasonable expectation to wake up at some point in the future whether it's six hours or eight hours or seven, however many hours you sleep, you're not going to wake up in the past. You can't live in the past and plan for the future. Now during my time on the city council here in Van Alstine in the past two years, I have stepped on some toes. I have uh, disrupted some patterns of behavior and I have exposed some wrongs. What I feel like we have accomplished, or I have accomplished, along with the council and the mayor, is that we have cleared a path to allow Van Alstine to grow. We have, we have changed management. 
on several levels with the city of Van Alstine, and I feel like that's just part of clearing the path. We have to have an effective city management team, and that includes the city manager, the mayor, the council, and it takes all of us working together. It takes the management team and especially the understanding and consideration of the citizens of Van Alstine. I'm going to ask you tonight for your vote on May 12th so I can uh, uh, allow me to continue to do what I've been doing for the last two years and that is trying to make Van Alstine a better place to live and to do business. Hi, my name is Karen Teuber and I've lived in Van Alstine for over 20 years. I've uh, been uh, sort of below the surface in doing a lot of things within the city. I was uh, the city uh, election clerk, or excuse me, judge for 16 years. And then uh, I've worked with uh, teaching English as a second language in town and also uh, in other outlying communities. I've worked uh, and taught uh, ballroom dancing here in town as well as for the colleges. Uh, from Paris to Grayson uh, Community College and uh, up to Southeastern uh, Oklahoma State University. I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, getting ready for uh, this position because I've been trying to find out just what does a city council person do. And to me, uh, my goals for City Council are that we have transparency in the Council and that the citizens know what we're doing, that they can look at the budget, that they can see the uh, minutes of the meetings, that they can also uh, know, you know what is happening, get feedback from different decisions that are made we need to know, uh, and not just, you know, yeah, the newspaper gives us some uh, uh, findings, but I think it's important that these things be online, that the uh, checkbook be online, so that we are wide open, that everyone can see what's going on. I feel that it's extremely important that uh, the citizens be able to approach a person and talk, I'm just walking, uh, I've been walking, walking the streets, going from door to door, handing out literature, and, uh, you know, people were talking to me about the creek, the problems they have there, and uh, too many police cars, and uh, a lot of the problems that they're encountering, uh, that uh, they would like to be taken up and discussed. So we need to make some changes, and I feel that being wide open to the people and accessible is extremely important. So yeah, transparency, accountability, having a good business uh, environment, a friendly business environment, and also regulations that make sense. And that was brought home at one of the meetings where a gentleman was talking about the shed that he was trying to put up. and. You know, what is compatible or that. So anyhow, time. I thank you and I ask for your vote. <laughs> thank you for the introductions all. Uh, I need to make a note that one of our candidates who's running was unable to be here today. He did phone in earlier today to mention that he couldn't make it. This is Adam Weiss, Mr. Weiss. Uh, had to be out of town and so couldn't appear tonight. We're ahead of time, which is great, so it may leave some more room for questions. And I also, before we dive into the questions, want to give my own thanks for the participants here in the, the audience that um, you would take today, the tax day. I'm sure some of us are very tired of having to go to the <laughs> post office and submit it. Um, but we have that behind us, so let us be re-energized by having another year uh, to wait. So without further ado, because we may end up taking more times with questions, uh, even though we're one short tonight, let's go ahead right in. The first question is this. In the years you've spent in Van Alstine, 
What have you done in community service activity for the city? And we will start uh, with Mr. Jennings, please. <coughs> Uh, as I said, I moved here in 2005, and at that time I had built a home in Georgetown. Uh, since my moving here, I became very active and involved with the city because of the home I built in Georgetown. There was issues there in regards to the HOA. Uh, there were some issues early on in around 2006 with the city. Uh, my first contact with the city was actually because of some discrepancies in water building. Uh, some of you in here may have been involved in that, I don't recall. Uh, in some of those dealings, I became very familiar with the city manager at that time, the mayor at that time, the council at that time. Uh, began the efforts to help improve some of the conditions we had in Georgetown. Uh, put, led the effort, along with some assistance from neighbors, to form a group to that went and attempted to make remedies within the HOA. We went to the city, uh, sat through several meetings with the mayor, uh, manager at that time, uh, I believe council members at that time, sat in on meetings, uh, visited with the developers, uh, hoping to find solutions to some of the, the problems we had. Uh, and worked for literally till today still actively pursuing some of those efforts um, that would be to the extent of what i've done here in Bob van Alstine as far as community efforts and working with the city okay thank you <laughs> as i mentioned a while ago uh, i was a volunteer fireman here for many a year i also worked with the uh, people that got in trouble in municipal court and uh, was overseeing the uh, community service workers from municipal court on Saturdays uh, so these people could work out some of their fines. Uh, and like I say, I was instrumental in building these facilities for the city. Uh, 28 years in the fire department's a long time to be uh, a volunteer and, and, and doing for the city. And uh, that's about everything that I've done with the city. Uh, I did do a little work in public works uh, for about four months while I was looking for a public works director. And uh, I got out and worked with these guys just like uh, I was part of those guys working by the hour. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be a part of something, I feel that you need to get out and work with the people that in these uh, jobs and uh, I enjoyed working there and that's about the extent that I have uh, done for the citizens of Mount Austin. Activity for the city. Thank you. I came to Mount Austin four years ago on about June the 15th somewhere around there to visit friends that I had here in Mount Austin. I had retired from a radio station. I've been on the air a couple of hours a day talking about uh, community activities, uh, political uh, items, different events and concerns of that community. And uh, I really came, uh, came down here to visit and two weeks later I went back and loaded everything up and moved to Van Alstine on the 4th of July weekend. And I, I fell in love with the town when I, when I first moved down here because of the, the, the small town hospitality and the friendliness. My intention was to just stay in the kitchen with at, the, at the, what was called the rib joint at the time and just mind my own business and be the kitchen help. And that was, that's what I wanted to do, just to have a, a life that was much more, much less stressful than I had had as a radio station manager. After I saw some of the things that were going on in Van Alstine, I had met some of the city uh, management people and listened to the citizens of Van Alstine that were not happy with some of the things that were going on, were not happy with the response they were getting from their city management, I decided to take the experience that I had with, the, with uh, political experience, the uh, dealing with um, events and the, the different things that go on in, the, in city politics, I felt like I could contribute to that and to help, and that's why I decided to run. 
one of the things that I'm the most proud of that we've done with Buck Snort Barbecue is we have initiated a free Christmas lunch that we have from 11 to 3 on every Christmas day. We have a lot of volunteers that help with that. Last year we served over 250 people and uh, it is fun and rewarding to have an event like that that you can you can call on. I've worked uh, for different things, like I said, in the city. I was appointed as the election judge and did that for a total of 16 years. I was also appointed by a mayor way back uh, to the LEPC, which is the Emergency Preparedness Committee uh, or Council out of Sherman. And that was based on my Air Force training. I was a disaster preparedness officer. And no, I don't prepare disasters, but I've been trained <laughs> to, uh, in case of nuclear, biological, or chemical warfare, or any kind of like an accident on the interstate where a bomb or a missile would fall off. Uh, you know, I had that type of training through the, uh, my 27 years with the Air Force. And um, I've also, like I said, taught in the town, uh, and I've taught another uh, course that I've taught is poll watcher training, because I do believe in fair and honest elections. And so we have uh, several coming up between now and the primary, but uh, I think that's critical. So I think that's a, an important part of all of our elections. Another thing that I've been doing and been very active in is training uh, on what's happening in our country. And we've had uh, some people will say, oh yes, Tea Party, but the Tea Party is for education. And what we're doing is teaching people on things like uh, Second Amendment rights, our freedom of speech, and this type of training to include uh, sustainable development, uh, being aware of that, and not going into smart uh, meters. And there's a whole bunch of things that uh, the Constitution, we've read the Constitution, and just find that these types of uh, sessions are so informative for our young people and for our old people as well. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. It'll be addressed to Mr. Lewis first. What do you feel is the most important issue facing the city of Van Alstine in the next two years? Well, even in the next two years, what we need to really work on is saving some money uh, you know I, I, I don't know how they are now with putting money back but everybody hollers about let's fix my street I really believe we need to save some money for a couple of years and get some money put back to where we can fix the infrastructures under streets and, and then fix the streets and then they're fixed and we won't have to do it again uh, I wholeheartedly believe we need to work on uh, financial issues uh, and then after we get the finances where they need to be then we can open up and maybe do some stuff that needs to be done throughout the city. The most important thing for me is to have a set of plans. Uh, I was trained in this and uh, during my time in the Air Force I was the Deputy Director of Plans for the Reserve Personnel Center and I also was plans and procedures. And I think it's critical that we know where we're going, that we have a direction, not just you know, do this here today and this there today, tomorrow, but have a set of plans that we can uh, look forward to, that we have you know, what we're doing immediately, what we'll be doing in the next five years, and then even a 10-year plan, that we can be uh, going in a direction. and. Uh, we have some uh, situations, financial situations in the town, and getting ready for growth, I think, is so critical. Uh, and we can do this through planning. Uh, we need to become very business friendly and encourage people to come into the town, business people, so that we can get a basis for finances that we can take care of some of the immediate needs and the future needs that the city can grow and go forward. Okay. Uh, 
it, it's obvious to everyone what I'm saying that we live in a very unstable economic time. Uh, I deal with budgets daily, uh, develop and oversee a roughly $4 million annual budget, and I know what the economy has done for the last three years particularly. What the city is experiencing, and I'm somewhat on the outside looking in, but I've attended enough council meetings and I see the problems with the streets and various things like that with the town. What you're, what you're having problems with is a lack of planning in the past that built a capital reserve for these repairs, like referred to by Mr. Lewis. You must build a reserve. If you don't, deferred maintenance will overcome you. And that's the situation that the city of Van Austin is in. It has a high, very high degree of deferred maintenance in its streets, in its infrastructure, its water and its sewage. It takes years to build that, that reserve up. It, it can't be done in a matter of one or two years. It's going to be longer than that. It's going to be like Karen referred to as a five, ten, even a fifteen year plan to build this up. The only way to build that up is we need growth. And in order to get growth, we need to go out and we need to promote the assets that we have, which is our fire department, our police department, our school district. We need to bring people in that are paying taxes. We need to bring in businesses. We need to get the tax revenue base built up where we can start building capital reserve and go after the streets, go after the infrastructure, go after the phones that we have. I, I have seen on the have been on the council for the last couple of years. I've seen that there are a number of fronts that we need to attack for planning for the future. We need to have the infrastructure in place to be able to handle growth. Now I don't I don't have good news for you tonight. I'm i fixing the streets is not the number one thing that needs to be done because there's no money to do it for one thing. We don't have we've never had a plan in place to have perpetual maintenance for our sewer and water lines. That is a decades old problem that has never been addressed. It can't be done in one year, one term for any candidate. But we have to have the adequate infrastructure to have growth, which we don't have at this point. We, that's the first problem that we need to address. It's a catch-22. We don't have the infrastructure we want more growth, that's the answer. You either have growth and more houses built or you annex property, which is a very dangerous thing that I'm not even going to advocate. <laughs> but, but to have growth, you have to have adequate infrastructure. You have to have adequate sewer lines and adequate water lines to service those new homes. We don't have that. To me, that's the number one thing that we need to address is adequate infrastructure, not, not the aging infrastructure or the streets, but we have to be able to have the sewer lines and the water lines adequate to handle the growth that we need to make our town grow. Third question, it's an issue that I've heard even from as far away as Fairview. It's this discussion about whether Van Alstein should have a city manager, manager type of uh, government or a mayoral administrative form of government. So the third question, and it will be addressed to Mr. Smith first, do you plan to work with the city manager form of government? And how, what do you think about the police department and the fire departments at present? The only way we can be successful in Van Alstein is to have a city manager form of government. You can't ask an elected mayor, a volunteer, to run a $5 million budget. An elected person that is volunteering for that position doesn't have the knowledge, doesn't have the experience or the education to be a city manager. Van Alstein is past the point that a city administrator, mayor form of government can be successful. It can't happen. We need someone that is educated, that is experienced, and is dedicated to making a town grow. There are too many laws that are in effect. There are too many, too many factors that we have to consider when, you, when your city grows. We have to have a professional to get us out of the, of the trap that we're in. And I, I don't use that word lightly. We have financial issues in Van Alstein. We have, we have infrastructure issues that we have to address. A city manager form of government is the only, or the city manager form of government is the only way that we can be successful. 
I think our police department has, has taken a great turn. I think it's great that Tim Barnes has been appointed as chief of police. I think our fire department continuously trains and is ready for whatever comes their way. I'm very proud of what, of what the police department, compared to the police department I knew four years ago, we are leaps and bounds above what we had. And the fire department is equally as aggressive in their training and their dedication to the city. Well, when the issue was first brought up uh, and the vote was taken about a uh, city manager form of government, I supported it and endorsed it 100%. I have not changed my mind, nor do I waver in any way. I think that we, as Jim has said, we do need a someone that's qualified, someone that has studied and trained for uh, this type of uh, position and uh, a volunteer from within the city, I just don't think could handle the problems that we're facing and uh, help us out. I, uh, like I said, I endorse exactly what Jim has said, that uh, it is critical that we have uh, someone in place, and I think the individual that is there now is qualified. He has been doing a lot in just a very short time to uh, improve things or to, to get things on the, a road to success. Um, as far as the fire and police department are, um, I have people coming to me saying, well, you know, we have too many cars. These are things that I'd like to look at when I get elected uh, to see just, you know, it, are there problems that minor things that can uh, be changed and uh, you know salaries has been also something that I've been confronted with so these things need looking at and working with the city manager I think we will conquer these uh, situations uh, in uh, time I fully support the city manager <coughs> means of, of the city of Animal State uh, when you deal with uh, firms such as the EPA, TCEQ, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you may be with them. There was so much involved. I recently went through an EPA audit uh, two years in the completing. Uh, there was so much red tape, paperwork involved in these, these types of, of transactions that you must have someone on a professional level that knows, that knows what they're dealing with. Uh, one of the things that I noted in some of my early early uh, encounters with City Hall was I felt there needed to be a higher degree of professionalism. And I fully believe that Mr. Rodriguez, who has been hired by our current council, has done an excellent job in hiring Mr. Rodriguez. <clears throat> I have met with him several times. We have talked, we've discussed, and he is very committed to the City of Van Alstine very well educated, very well aware of the, the challenges that he faces, but yet he's willing to take those challenges on. Uh, as for the police and fire, the police and fire department, as I said before, is the biggest asset that we have in the school district. Uh, I believe Mr. Barnes, who I know also, very well uh, doing in his position currently as general chief. Uh, the fire department, I know there were some changes made as far as to who they answer to when the other city manager went out. Uh, they've one of the things that I noticed lacking was a level of structure and discipline within the, the city organization. Uh, being from a military background, I have a strong, strong drive for discipline and uh, drive and commitment. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez is doing that. He has placed responsibility back on people. He expects productivity from the people. And ultimately, there is accountability. And that's what we need. Thank you. Uh, you know, a few years back when uh, the petition came around for a city manager form of government, I felt it. That all seemed wasn't ready for a city manager form of government, okay? And uh, I kind of voted against it. But since then, you know, I feel that, that with what we have now in place with a city manager form of government, I feel that we have the best city manager that any city could have 
in Van Alstine. He's very fortunate to have Mr. Rodriguez as his city manager. Uh, as far as our fire and police, <clears throat> I think we have the best uh, entities that they are uh, around. And, uh, you know, everything came together yesterday when the tragedy happened downtown Van Alstine. We had a police and fire rescue team there that was trained and knew what to do. The city manager was on scene. This is what I like to see in a city manager. I don't want to see the city manager sit in his office and never get out and communicate with the people. So therefore, I think we have a fine one. Our police chief in the past didn't communicate, but the one we have now, you see him out communicating with people. Uh, the fire department, I hadn't seen the fire chief out communicating with people. But you know, communication with our citizens is vital importance. You know where your police and fire and your city manager stand, and we do have the best facilities that, that money can buy, we have. Uh, we have a great city manager, a police chief, and a fire chief. So, you know, we need to uh, uh, get out and kind of meet these guys and, and understand why they do their job, but uh, we have the best that we have to offer is in Van Alstine. Thank you. The next question we have will be addressed to Ms. Toyber first. And it, is a, it has several components, so I'll go through it a little slowly. As a city council member, <coughs> what's your plan as a team member on taking Van Alstine into the future? Or as I like to call it, um, your position in terms of wanting to bring in new business or to keep it country? And we'll start with Ms. Toyberg. Well, as I've said before, I think we need goals and uh, a direction, a plan. I think uh, I had served uh, or was a member of the Sherman Chamber of Commerce for a while. And uh, that's when I had my business over in Gunner. I had a small embroidery factory over there. And I joined the uh, chamber in Sherman and watched how they were going out and actively going after business to include going up to Canada to try to recruit people to come into the town, into the Sherman Denison area, or basically Sherman area. And I think we do have to be active and aggressive in going out to uh, find businesses. Now, you know, we have a lovely, uh, quaint uh, downtown area, and I think the downtown area uh, with a lot of retail shops will make it so much more inviting for people to come and to shop here and of course that will give us tax revenues. Also, uh, you know, the industrial park is there and we can bring in, as recently we had uh, Caterpillar come and uh, use one of the facilities. But we need to go out and get business, and all kinds of business. Uh, the, like I said, uh, retail stores, uh, businesses, and uh, move on to uh, industrial types of things. So I'm for all of the above. <laughs> OK. Uh, I will very much be a team member on council. Uh, I believe that the council needs to work collaboratively with the new manager and we need to come up with long-range plans, five-year, 10-year, 15-year, like I said before. These plans need to be conveyed over to our CDC and EDC and they need to be directed in what the city needs, the direction we need to head and what we expect in, in the years to come. Uh, I fully understand, like I said earlier, I, I grew up in a small town, uh, probably could walk uh, 15 miles and a knock on the door and on someone at any time. I understand small town hospitality, but hospitality is also a state of mind. You can maintain a small town hospitality and grow. And if you don't grow, uh, ultimately it, it, you're withering on the vine. Uh, you will cease to exist and you can drive. I ride motorcycles and I love to take the back roads, stay off the interstates. And as you drive through Route 66, some of the old routes and things like that, you go through the towns that are withered and dying. Uh, they're all over the United States. 
And Ballastein should not be like that sitting on 75. We have the capability to thrive and grow, and we have the distance that's perfect from the metropolitan to Dallas to bring in the people, to bring in the businesses that we need. Now, there may be issues Mr. Smith's referring to as the infrastructure, which I know there is. That will have to be set out as a group, collectively decide, do we go after infrastructure first or do we go after growth first? I haven't made a decision on either one, but I'm hoping to either one when we set out and work together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I am ready to be a team player with uh, the council, the rest of the council members if I'm elected. Uh, I'm ready to be a team player with the EDC, CDC, and the Chamber of Commerce. All of these facilities or these groups have to work together to make this city grow and move forward. And uh, I don't think in the past that that has happened. You know, <clears throat> we teach our kids sports and uh, they learn how to play together. Sometimes the grown-ups don't play too good together. So I think that yeah, what we've got here is, is, is these, all of these organizations are fine organizations, but they're not working together as a team. So if you put everybody together as a team, like you would a firefighter in his fire station, everybody trains together, everybody breaks bread together, everybody works together. That's how you're able to save uh, structure fires, you're able to save the people's structures and their lives because you work together as a team. So yes, I believe uh, a team player is very important to the city council of Van Alstein and be a team player with the rest of the organizations to move this city forward. Thank you. That if you, everybody works together and you make a little growth come to Van Alstein, we have to go out and recruit that growth to get it here. You know, uh, if we don't work together to get it here, then it's not going to grow. I mean, it's simple as that. Uh, the infrastructure is under the ground, the water and the sewer. That is something that has to be addressed. Uh, the city does charge an impact fee for that type of facilities. If that impact fee money was put back in a place to where nobody touches it, then we'll have money to work on our infrastructures. But it should have started years ago. Uh, but since then, uh, with a new city manager, I, I believe that the infrastructures should be put into a deposit in the bank by themselves to correct the infrastructures under the ground. Thank you. I, I agree with, with the candidates about a combined effort with the money that is being dedicated to the EDC and the CDC. That's a fourth of our sales tax. That's, that's a, a quarter percent goes to each entity. I think that money combined with the help of the chamber and funding by the chamber and the city could step us up, ramp us up to have one individual that could do more for the city as far as promotions and, and going out and seeking people and not waiting for somebody to come here looking for something. The, the, as I've said, the infrastructure is something that has to be there before you can build houses and build businesses. You have to have that. So that's an important thing to do, but I think the, the combined effort under, under a more of a single management has been mentioned by, by our city manager. The, the EDC, the CDC, and the city, and with the help of the chamber, we can do some, we can do some amazing things. We can draw people in. As far as keeping a cosmopolitan or country, I'm obviously going to vote for country. We still have to have cosmopolitan. We still have to be able to attract people to live here and to come here. But I happen to have a business that's that's patronized by by the, the folks that come from Dallas on the motorcycles that want to come into a little place that's that's hometown, that is uh, the, a lot of them refer to as a hole in the wall, the single, the sole proprietor type business. If somebody comes to my store and the door's unlocked and they come in and I'm not there, they usually know to go to the drugstore because I'm probably over there drinking coffee. That's the Mayberry effect that I want us to keep and the people of Van Alstein are the ones that make, make it country. Is, is something that will clarify what all of you in some ways have alluded to. You've all kind of stressed the need to have a long-term plan, a 5, 10, maybe even 15-year plan that 
that the council and, and government as a whole are working toward. And this is a big picture question before we get to some nitty gritty details, but what would your vision be for Van Alstein in five or 10 years? And for this, we'll start with Mr. Jennings. Okay, in five or 10 years, um, once we sit down and develop a plan, we, we, the budget is the most critical thing. Uh, not knowing for certain the budgets and the um, percentages it's, that's set aside and allocated for the various departments and things like this. Uh, I can tell you firsthand that uh, in the budgets I work with, utilities are a tremendous cost. Uh, the city, I would think utilities would be somewhat significant in that we're lighting uh, the communities or pumping water. Um, we need to look at the utilities and, and means there that we can, can uh, produce some cost savings. Uh, one area that I know that I have not been involved with, but I have been involved in the past, I have been involved with the city, I would say, uh, is wastewater treatment. A uh, tremendous amount of water can be, uh, not done, a tremendous amount of money can be spent in wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, I have worked with those facilities for 30 plus years. I think in five years, I think we need to look at streamlining the budget, looking at where our greatest expenses are, seeing where we can produce some savings, seeing where we can start <coughs> saving for the capital reserve that we need to build, and make the first five-year goal to establish some type of a capital reserve where we can start then working on the infrastructure and going in that direction. I'll follow up uh, with that question. If the candidates could say maybe one or two areas where they see potentially saving in the budget um, as they answer that question. Specific programs yeah. or areas to cut? Uh, I think I touched on that. I, I think you need to look at some of your areas such as, as utilities and water treatment. Um, there would be some hard decisions made and I, I would need to look at it, but uh, health care. I know for a fact health care is a tremendous cost in, in budgets and in labor. Uh, there's numerous areas that you need to start looking and there'll be some difficult decisions that may, may need to be made. Uh, I make them now. Uh, some of them are very, very hard to make, some of them are hard to make than others. Uh, some of them at times affect people's lives and uh, become very difficult. But you have to look at everything. When you get into the situation that I feel the city is in, uh, as far as infrastructure and the things we need to address, nothing to be set aside. Everything will need to be looked at as far as cost savings. Thank you. In five to ten years, I'd like to see Van Alstine with some nice paved streets and you know, <laughs> and some curbs and gutters put in them. But it's going to take a, a, a whole lot more than uh, than my imagination to make this happen. I, I would like to see Van Alstine with a few more businesses, a few more rooftops to help. Uh, some of these uh, budget items that we have, uh, I believe it can be made possible uh, in five or ten years to uh, have uh, some more businesses in Van Alstine to help pay some of these expenses in rooftops that pays uh, taxes. Uh, and that's what we're lacking. Uh, it, you say uh, cut uh, items. Uh, at this time, I couldn't really tell you what we need to cut without studying the budget. Uh, it's been about nine years since I looked at the city budget. But you know, the first thing people want to holler is, why do we have 10 police cars? Can't we cut some of those police cars? Why does the fire truck have to go with an ambulance every time it makes a call? Well, you go to cutting from these two entities, and guess what happens? People lose their lives. So now we're looking at health care here. Do we really want to cut? And that's the first two places that people's going to complain we need to cut. But just as sure as the world turning, if we cut it, we're going to have problems. So I think we really need to look at other items uh, before we go to cutting our public safety and our fire and EMS. And that's for a bunch of people you'll hear it on the streets every day. Why do we have so many cop cars? We have to have them, okay? We have to have all those fire trucks in there. We have to have all the policemen, all the firemen. So 
I really, I don't know where we would start cutting that until I sat down and looked at a budget. But those are two entities that, that I probably wouldn't touch. I tried to f figure out a way to give the fire department and the EMS just a few more dollars to operate right. with. Okay. Looking five years down the, down the road, I've tried to do that consistently as looking into the future and seeing what we can do. One of the things that I don't think we ask our city manager if he had the ability to do is to juggle. I think we should have asked him that because that's what it's going to take. Van Alstein has spends almost a million dollars a year on bond payments. Our tax revenue from property tax is about a million dollars. We spend all of our money that we get from property tax just to pay <coughs> our notes, just to pay our bonds. And those bond payments are, are scheduled to go up a substantial amount every year for the next five years. That's a tough thing to have to, to, have to deal with when you have more expense and uh, more expense with bond payments. Uh, cutting cost, I think our city manager has, uh, has proven that. We had a, uh, when our chief of police uh, retired, we moved somebody up. His position, Barnes's position, was not filled. We've, we're saving about $90,000 a year or more on that position. Every time somebody is eliminated from, the, from the, the employment of the city, that position is not filled. That's a cost-cutting cost uh, method. One of the things on health insurance that I don't think a lot of people know, and I tried at the last, last budget uh, uh, meetings that we had, the city of Van Alstein pays 100% of the employee's insurance. If you have your spouse or your kids on your insurance, the city pays half of that. If you have your entire family, which is a $19,000 a year premium, the city pays 75% of that cost. We have to get real. I don't like to hurt people. I don't want, I don't want to cost people money, especially our employees that are dedicated to our town, but you have to get in touch with reality. Nobody, there's not a business anywhere, municipal business, that pays 75% of somebody's insurance for their family and their spouse. <laughs> in, uh like I said, planning, I think, is, a, is very critical, and we need to be looking to the future, and again, I feel one way is to bring businesses in. Uh, also, to attract uh, growth in, uh, we have, as I was walking some of the streets, there are so many vacant homes. I was absolutely shocked at how many homes are uh, being torn down or uh, need to be torn down, uh, vacated, just uh, people not living there. So we're missing tax dollars that way too from uh, people who, uh, homes being vacant. So that's one way that uh, if we can uh, improve uh, the uh, housing situation as well as getting the businesses, I think that'll be help. One of the areas that has been a real concern of mine is uh, I've been looking at at the county level as well as the city level is the salaries, the benefits, and the entitlements. And uh, I haven't delved into completely the Texas municipal uh, retirement system, but I think that we need to look at that. I've looked at things like uh, in San Diego, they've gone to a uh, 401k system and these are things that I'd like to look at and see if there are ways that we can cut costs uh, by and, and also help the employees by changing some of these things around so that we have a uh, less cost to the city but also uh, a chance for people to grow their their wealth as well through another system I know uh, military uh, retirement systems are being looked at. Everything is being looked at, and I think it's time we do that too. Where we'd like to see Van Alstine in five to ten years, and some of the areas we might have to cut in order to, to focus on some things we'd like to see down the road. We could talk about the, the revenue side, though, in a little bit more depth. What do you see as other possible revenue streams for the community? in terms of attracting businesses, tax revenues, or even annexing other areas within the ETJ. And I'd like to start the question with um, Mr. Lewis. Revenues or annexing? 
uh, as far as annexing, when you go to annexing some land in, you're going to have to put the infrastructures in. We don't have the money for that. Uh, as far as other revenues uh, coming into the city, uh, we need to give some incentives. Maybe a little incentive to somebody to uh, bring a business to Van Austin. You know, uh, EDC donated land to uh, Metal Industries. They donated land to Foxworth, and that's a great deal. But you see, Foxworth, they're not paying the revenue and taxes because uh, the contractors is the guys that pays their taxes quarterly and guess where the majority of them live? Collin County. So we're not getting the tax revenue off of that. Uh, what we need is a nice lumber yard that we can go to and buy materials. So we need to attract a lumber yard for that purpose where we can get tax revenue. So we need to give some incentives to uh, to get these businesses to come to town and, and utilize us, like the 16 acres that Metal Industries got that brought Metal Industries here, and now they drove off and left us high and dry after they got their 16 acres of land. And Foxworth is not benefiting us a whole bunch because they're not paying them much tax revenue. You know, those taxes are going to Collin County. So we need to all work together and get more uh, revenue started in town and I believe that given some incentives we could attract uh, a bunch of businesses. I've learned over the years to preface some of my statements with I have been told or I, it's my understanding because I, I, I have trusted people with what they've told me and sometimes that, that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, annexation is, is probably the quickest form of, of generating revenue. It would, be, it would be extremely difficult politically as well as financially to do that. As an example, and again this is one of those I've been told, the Cold Springs Industrial Park that Van Alstein has is outside the city limits. Mr. Swift, the, the head guy from Caterpillar, was in my restaurant the other day and he said we're going to add five million dollars worth of uh, value to that building that's going to increase your taxes that we pay to the city. No, it's not. The industrial park is outside the city limits. That, that is, and, and that's attractive to, to businesses to be outside so you don't have to pay the city sale, the city property tax. So it's a, it's a good draw, but that is an example of it's great to have that company and, and they're going to have 75 employees there that fortunately for me have to eat lunch somewhere and I have I've tried my best to develop a relationship and a friendship with them for them to do that. But we have to have, we have, to have a combination of, of several factors. One, increasing businesses is the, is the fastest way. Increasing rooftops, but we still have the issue with infrastructures that we have to, we have to provide for those. Well, I've been saying all along, I think we need to bring businesses in. Uh, it's, you know, in, over the years that I've lived here, I've noticed one place will open and another place will close, and it's just been uh, no growth. Uh, and uh, some of the things that I've heard are that people don't support the restaurants, people don't support the businesses, and consequently they, uh, small businesses can't, can't exist without people uh, going to them. Uh, most of the people who uh, have vehicles, other than you know, people that just live right in the city and walk to places, most of them will go up to uh, Sherman, to Sam's, or down to Walmart or the Target centers. So uh, we have to find ways and work together uh, with all the different entities in town to make the businesses in town attractive and uh, encourage people to shop locally. So, uh, as far as uh, getting revenues, uh, yes, increasing businesses, and you know, I've I've heard uh, people say, well, you know, if we have all these mail order or, or these uh, different types of businesses, we're not getting revenue from that. I haven't checked that out. I don't know what the thing is, but I think we do need more businesses that actually sell things. 
So uh, annexation, I don't know that much about it, so I can't talk to that. Uh, I know that they've tried to work with Anna and getting different things in, but uh, are dividing areas. Uh, developers have come and gone, and uh, you know, building homes and uh, building businesses, I think, are the ways that we'll get uh, the basis for growth and, and money. Uh. What I envision is, and I touched on it earlier, I think we need to build with the assets we currently have. Uh, we have a, a tremendous school system. Uh, Karen made reference to empty houses. We need to work on putting people in these houses to get families in here, paying for the tax base. It's not adding to the infrastructure, the homes already exist. Uh, we need to go after a demographic of 25 to 40 with school aged children and put, put the younger families in here. We need to go after business. Uh, the business we need to go after is businesses such as O'Reilly, AutoZone, Premier Pond, businesses that went to Anna and built that don't put a lot on your infrastructure. They, they are businesses that bring in people that add to the tax base, but they don't add to the burden of having to support the infrastructure by, like a restaurant would. <laughs> <laughs> we need restaurants, but you don't have the... <laughs> We don't have a lot of the grease traps, food preparation, some of those things. Uh, stay with what we have. We have some homes we need to sell. We need to draw small businesses that don't want the infrastructure. Uh, that can be done without annexing. I have to learn more about annexing. Uh, don't know enough to even speak on it right now. Uh, but would think that would be one of the last things we would do to draw business. I think we would have the assets to draw businesses and families now and build from that point. Okay. We're going to get much more specific. The general questions are passed, and I hope we can maintain our civility through the next <laughs> round. <laughs> For some of you, it might be a nice wake-up. Uh, again, keep in mind that I do not make these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and to remain impartial throughout. These questions come from the Chamber of Commerce, and of course those um, that have come in Several of you have turned in questions. Uh, if we got to them, we're, we're reading them. So now we're, we're to the nitty gritty. The first question will be directed to Mr. Smith. And how do you perceive the current status of our police and fire and city manager positions and salaries as, and as well as results? Now we've, we've gone into the position somewhat already, but with regard specifically to salaries and results. As being part of the, the council that hired our, our current city manager, we pay him, uh, his salary is 89900 That is a fair salary based on budget, city size, um, the, the number of employees. That, that's a very fair salary that we have for him. He has saved us more than his salary just since he's been here. He started on the 28th of November of last year. He's already saved us more than his salary will be for a year's time. He is very effective at what he's doing. The, the price tag that we have on our chief of police right now is appropriate, I think. It is much less than what we were paying a former police chief. Now you talk, you talk about the salary, which was the, the salary for the city manager is 89900 there was a term that uh, our interim city manager, Debbie Wheat, used as the fully loaded price. That's the cost of Social Security, insurance, retirement, all of those things that go into that. We were paying 106000 for our former city manager. We're paying eighty nine nine for the city manager that we have now, and he's done a, a, a job ten times better than has been done in the past, in my opinion. We had a chief of police that, was, that his, his salary alone was in excess of $95,000 a year. That has been reduced down to somewhere around 60 something and I'm not sure the, the exact figure. I think our fire department, we noticed in the last budget go around that our fire department in proportion to other city employees is underpaid and we took a step to, to add money to the salaries. That I, as a side note, our, police, our fire chief took that $22,000, I believe it was, for salaries. He took none of that himself. 
he gave the entire amount to his employees. Okay, well, I think the city manager's salary is fair, and I have uh, seen you know, changes in the short time that he's been here, uh, which, uh, shall I say, the uh, former city manager, I think, uh, we didn't see those types of results in the entire the five years that he was there. So I think that uh, Philip Rodriguez is uh, his salary. He's earning it, and it's a fair uh, price. Uh, the uh, fire chief, um, I don't know what he earns, uh, so I can't say whether it's fair or not. Uh, the police chief, uh, like uh, Jim mentioned, the that uh, the uh, one gentleman has not been replaced, and uh, Barnes is now our acting chief, and I think that his salary is somewhere around sixty-eight thousand, and I think that's comparable to uh, the surrounding communities. Uh, from what I've heard, I, again, I haven't seen all the facts or figures, but uh, I do understand that there are uh, a lot of high-paid. At least I've been told there have been a lot of there are a lot of high-paid salaries, and these are you know we can take care of some of this with benefits. And as we look at what the retirement and other benefits and entitlements are, that these things can be uh, taken care of. So. Uh, I think that answers the question. Yes, to the, to the best of your ability, I believe so, without having all the... Salaries is in one of the hardest things to, to talk about anytime you're looking at budgets and, and uh, decisions that need to be made. I would never be, I wouldn't say, I, 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 I would never be a proponent of going in immediately and cutting salaries. Uh, it may be something you would look at and consider, but in doing that, you you do you could do so much damage to the structure of your city, the morale, the productivity, a lot of things that Mr. Rodriguez is working on how to build. There are several other things that can be done, and uh, I have been involved in. Uh, I work with Mr. Steele, who's sitting here in the audience. Uh, we had our retirement cut 50% by our employer uh, three years ago. Uh, it doesn't affect you immediately as far as your take home it affects you long in your retirement but there's, there's some things that can be looked at that can assist in, in, in uh, your budget preparation and things you're doing without being detrimental to your lifestyle at that moment uh, there are other instances where uh, furloughs are oftentimes uh, administered a uh, furlough, for those who may not know, is uh, everyone is looked at salary-wise based off of hourly rates, and each one is required to take three days off a year without pay. Uh, various things like this can be looked at to, to help help you through your budget constraints as, as you go through these times. But just to go in and cut salaries can be very demoralizing. Uh, not a good decision to make. To go in and just cut staff is not a good decision to make. Uh, I think we need to let the city manager that we've hired come to the council with proposals that he has in these areas and let the council make those decisions. I think he has the expertise and the education and the knowledge to do those. And we're certainly. I don't believe that I would really uh, want to have the city manager's job for 899 <laughs> okay, and if y'all will watch Mr. Rodriguez, he's going to start losing a little bit of hair. Because he's going to pull it out. I uh, wouldn't do the police chief job. You know, uh, you can stand over there and say, well, no, you're not going to shoot me. That don't mean you're not going to shoot you. I don't care how much money you put out there. Your fire chief, <clears throat> I believe that he, from my understandings, he might be just a little bit underpaid. Uh, I think he's doing a great job. Uh, since I've been there, they have uh, moved forward uh, after I left, and, and, and maybe it was time for me to retire and get out of it and let somebody move it to another stage. And I think 
uh, Mr. Baker has done that. But I believe he is a little bit underpaid with his salary. Uh, the other two gentlemen, the city manager and the police chief, I think is on target, but I still wouldn't have their job. Uh, and uh, I think that they're doing a great job and I, I think the city manager needs to do what needs to be done right for the city. We hired him to do a job and I believe we need to let him do his job. And I believe he will make these cuts that, that we need to make to make the city uh, move forward. So uh, my suggestion is just to leave it to the city manager to take care of these cuts and stuff. Since the resurfacing of Highway 5 and Waco Street and the way it's now striped, it's unsafe to walk down the highway because there's no shoulder. In addition, this person noted that the state was putting in handicap ramps that go to nowhere. <laughs> in addition, maybe on some of these homes that are vacant, I can't tell, but uh, this person that wrote in uh, said citizens are sometimes taking up the sidewalks and not replacing them. So that motivated the question about what steps can be taken to fix or replace the sidewalks to make it safer for folks to use. Ms. Toyber, we turn to you first. Okay, well, the sidewalks are in bad condition, there's no doubt about it, and they have, some have disappeared on the street that I live in, on, and uh, that requires money from the city. Uh, they are city property. I know uh, where I live, the city, you know, or the sidewalk is way out from my place. So, yeah, they, uh, until we get a business base and tax uh, money in, we're not going to be able to really fix the sidewalks because the streets need repair. Uh, the And it isn't safe to walk on the streets, that is for sure. So, uh, it's... This is one of the continuing problems that we need to address that uh, getting money in, you know, having uh, budgeting and uh, eventually being able to replace some of these sidewalks uh, is all that we can do at this point. Okay. And Mr. Jennings, you're going to take the issue. You hit right bottom sticks to say it's, <laughs> it's uh, I know it comes down to an order of priority and any one person's need is at that time the most urgent. Uh, I deal with, with those things daily. One thing I've noticed going down Highway 5 in relation to the sidewalks is the city should take the efforts to go down and at least mow, trim, get the grass down where you can do things cosmetically and make a lot of difference just in the way something appears. Uh, I'm not sure on the ownership of the sidewalks being the city's versus homeowners. Uh, I would have to look into that. I, I would think if it was homeowners sidewalks that they should be ordinances in places that pieces of sidewalks are coming up, they should be made to put back down. I would, I would be interested in knowing what the, what the exact ownership is on those. Uh, property. Sir? City property. Okay. If they're city property, then it, 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 it again falls under the dilemma that we are, we are in and been talking about the streets. It goes back to, uh, I hate to say the word, poor decisions or weak management or whatever you want to call it, but it's, it has called up to the city of Van Alstine, uh, like it catches up with everyone else. Uh, the council, the city manager, needs to start immediately. It should have started years before now, but there needs to be a itemized list of priorities made as to the most urgent needs of the city. Those need to be addressed as they can with what funds may be available. That's where we get into looking at the issues we've already talked about. Where can we save in other areas of the budget? Where can we get $60,000 to repair sidewalks over on Highway 5? Those things can be found, but it's gonna take efforts and it's gonna to have to take people with the commitment to go in and look at it and find the money and do it. You know, as you look in Georgetown, Georgetown Heights, and you see nice uh, sidewalks running down the street, the guys that built those houses and developed that down there poured those concrete sidewalks. Now, as a new structure is being built, it ought to be made mandatory that he pour sidewalks in front of his house. 
you do a major renovation, there ought to be a code there that says, hey, you need to pour sidewalks in front of your house. Now, once these sidewalks are poured and in place, it is the city's responsibility to maintain them. So, you know, you go down to uh, Georgetown and the city cuts a water meter out of the sidewalk down there, guess what? The city pours it back. The guys that built the houses poured the sidewalks. So it is the city's responsibility to maintain that sidewalk once you pour it. So my suggestion would be is to, if you're gonna build a new structure, make it a code that they have to put a sidewalk in front of their house. If it's on a corner, it needs to be ADA accessible. You know, we, we have restrooms that's code. It has to be ADA, you know. Y'all was talking about the state came along and poured ADA accessible sidewalks on the corners. That's the law, they have to do that. But after that, it's the homeowner's responsibility to pour that sidewalk and it is the city's responsibility to maintain it once it's poured. That's the only alternative I've got to say to this question. Okay, thank you. I got a lot of phone calls and, and a lot of visits at my store but when Highway 5 was redone. It's not the city that did that, it's the state that did it. And it's a waste to have a, a ramp that's accessible to a sidewalk that you couldn't get a wheelchair down if you wanted to. It seems like a waste of money and it is. But that's a state issue that we need to address on a state level as opposed to a city level. I agree with Robert that, that as a code requirement, you could do that. If somebody builds a new home or renovates a new, uh, an existing home, to require that as one of the, one of the city codes. I think that would be great. One of the things that I've noticed, because I'm out on the streets, I have a little dog that I walk quite a bit. A lot of you have seen me doing that. We have a lot of curb and gutters that are full of dirt. I have, a, I have a solution for that, and it's not going to cost anything. It's called a shovel, or it's called a fire hose, or something to, to clean out the curb and gutters that we have. When the curb and gutters are so full of water, are so full of dirt, when it rains, the water goes out on the street, and then at some point will find itself back in the curb, the curb and gutter. That's what it's designed for, is to handle the water when it rains and get it to a, to a drainage point. If we just clean out the curbs and gutters that we have, would be a help. We can't control what the state does, as, as many phone calls as the city has made to them. We can't, we can't dictate what's going to be done with ADA requirements. That's, that's something with the rules we have to follow. But on Highway 5, I, I, I agree, that is the avenue that people judge our town by. And we have to develop the pride of the neighborhood to help on that on that process also. It's not something that, that the city can fund by itself. You know, you know, for that, I've got to come back and ask for a little bit of clarification. You mentioned the shovels and the fire hose, but who exactly would be moving those? Would it be the, the business and homeowners? No, or? it would be the, the city could do that. The city has a crew that can dedicate a day or, or a half a day or, or a few hours a day on a, on a regular schedule to do that. All the curb and gutters don't have to be cleaned in one day or they work on it until it's finished. The city crew has the ability to do that. They have the front end loaders that can clean them out. I jokingly said the fire department could wash them out and I understand now that there's an ordinance against that because you can't just push the dirt on down the street. You, gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have to deal with it at the time. So, so the, the city would be responsible for that on a, on a timely basis. protecting and energizing our historic downtown in Van Alstine. In particular, the motivation for the question comes from telemarketing businesses that are coming to Van Alstine and that want to come to Van Alstine. The uh, person that sent in this question noted that they don't provide inviting retail storefront, nor do they pay sales tax. In addition, the retail and service businesses are, are mutual, mutually beneficial, whereas telemarketers are seeking to, to buy several storefronts in a row, uh, and they may not be as inviting as other types of retail businesses. So with respect to telemarketing businesses, uh, the ones that have moved in and, and those that may be coming, what would you do to help protect 
the historic downtown from them and to further energize the downtown area. And this question will first be addressed to Mr. Jennings. Okay. Um, like I referred to earlier in, in small town hospitality, I think you know hospitality is a mindset and growth can accommodate hospitality. Uh, I do believe, though, a historic downtown area should be maintained as a historic downtown area. That is part of that mindset. Uh, without knowing the ordinances and restriction currently involving downtown, it would be, in, I think, in the interest of the city to make sure that we do protect those areas of town. Uh, telemarketing, while we would welcome that type of business, there should be an area for that. Uh, not necessarily in the downtown. Uh, the downtown areas to me should be your barbecue. Uh, it should be a mall shop. It should be an antique shop. Uh, it should be a museum. Uh, it should be areas to promote your town and the heritage and, and what the people are living in Van Austin for. Uh, telemarketing can go on the other side of 75. They can come over here where the uh, Sonic is and where the college is over here. Uh, like I say, they would be welcome, but there's an area they need to be in. Um, I think that's something that, that the city should promote. Uh, I think we should promote a historic downtown. We should build a historic downtown. We should. Right. Pardon? Yeah. Pardon? We have quilting in a historical house yeah. in downtown. We go. I go to uh, Eureka Springs and some of these areas, and it, it's. Uh, I go because my wife likes it, but. Uh, <laughs> It draws a lot of attention and it brings a lot of people in and you, you have these the old folksy art type uh, events going on and it's it's wholesome and it's good uh, and I'd like to see things like that in downtown Austin. Okay, thank you. I believe uh, the majority of y'all have uh, noticed downtown uh, how the parking is. If you put telemarketing in downtown our historic downtown buildings, guess what? You want to go to his barbecue place, you can't get there because they're parking there. So that's going to take up all the parking downtown. We're not going to be able to park downtown and go to Buck's North Barbecue and eat. Uh, senior citizens is going to have problems getting in to the senior club around there. So uh, my take on all this is, is let's keep uh, telemarketing out of downtown and make us a historic downtown. So when our people go down there, they can find a place to park. It's hard enough to find a place now. Imagine three or four telemarketing companies being downtown Van Austin. There's going to be no parking for us to go to uh, Bucksnard or the elderly to use the SNAP Center. Uh, so I don't believe that we need telemarketing downtown. We've all heard that term slippery slope, and I think that's what you start going down when you when the government tells you what you can and can't do with your business. My idea is to, as a supply and demand, you can buy office space or you can rent office space in an area that's less expensive than it would be downtown. But we have to create an environment in our downtown that makes it desirable to be a part of there. We have, uh, I noticed though the other day when I was walking on the, on the street that we're talking about with Walker, the Walker building up to Nacho Mama's, half of the businesses are empty. I think we need to concentrate on getting those businesses full and getting somebody in there and create a demand for the, for the business and the, the buildings that are downtown instead of restricting and telling people what they can and can't rent their property for. I think that would be a dangerous thing to do. If we create enough demand for that property where we can charge more for it and have a better better income for, for the investment that we have, would be a better approach to it than to, than to ask the government to step in and restrict what you can do. I've always had a philosophy in business that if you have something worth, worth coming to get or to, to buy from, people are going to find a way to get there. It may be a little inconvenient, but if you, if you have a product that is worth having, people will find a way to get there. But we have to create a demand for the businesses in downtown so we can get more people down there generating sales tax. Subjects been pretty well covered. <laughs> but I do think that uh, there is a problem with the parking and uh, 
one thing the city could do would be to require them to have, provide parking spaces uh, so that uh, for the telemarketers who are working there and allow spaces for the businesses to have people that they can come and go and uh, not uh, block businesses or the senior center or the you know the restaurants and that but um, as far as uh, ideally I think it would be nice if they uh, telemarketers were in a a, an area since they don't generate a lot of sales tax for us that they would be elsewhere but and also that would help keep this town like we wanted to look you know country and, and quaint and I know when I lived in, in uh, Gunner I would bring people that were that came to visit me over here because it, it was the Wild West look and it was like you know you saw in the movies and you could run from uh, house stop to house stop or business to business and uh, I think we'll lose that uh, if we start uh, having telemarketers there so yes uh, we can do some sort of a uh, parking uh, restriction for them but uh, I'm not sure if we can stop them from uh, renting buying or opening question I think we could answer in, in kind of a bullet form because we've touched on this theme already in terms of repairing the sidewalks but we did have a question specifically with regard to any plans you have um, to repair or patch the streets you know not not to patch them but actually to to do a long-term you know repair do you have any um, quick feedback you'd like to share with with the audience with regard to the street situation and, and doing repairs. You know, how, how much of a priority is it for you to push for that sooner than later? And we'll start this question with Mr. Lewis. You know, patching and repairing the streets is a necessity and I believe that uh, the city has already started to uh, begin to move forwards when they bought the new uh, equipment that they have down there. I believe they're waiting on some guys to get some CDL driver's license where they'll be uh, eligible to drive this truck that will patch potholes. Once you uh, get this truck in place and get it to working, I believe our streets will be uh, better to ride down with a little patch and repair and, and, and maybe get us through another two or three years to save money. Uh, I see nothing wrong with patching the streets. Uh, they're doing the best they can now. They put chat in them, and uh, yes, that's really not the best way to patch a pothole in the street, but I have to hand it to our public works director. If you complained about your pothole, he did put something in it, okay? And I'm one of these guys that complained, and I got chat put in my pothole, but it sure is a whole lot nicer than that big pothole. About every six months, I have to have my front end realigned on my trucks, and uh, yes, I gripe about it. But we have the equipment in place now. All we need to do is give these guys a chance to get their CDL license. And I believe once they, they've been to school on the truck already, that's my understanding. So what we need is for these guys to get their CDL license so they can drive the truck. And maybe some of these potholes that they can patch and get us through another two or three years with what we have. Okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Thank you. I was on the council at the, the last two budget hearings that we've had, a budget workshops we've had. That was the idea was brought to us about a pothole repair truck. Um, I could see that the city was not going to have money for the next five years to do any major street repairs. It, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and somebody could, could correct me here, I believe the council voted unanimously to buy that, that pothole repair truck because it's a good idea. We can't repair the streets, but we can have the best fixed potholes in Grayson <laughs> County. This unit is designed to, to cut out a square. It's designed to put a hot oil on. It's designed to put a hot mix on. It has a, a uh, weight that, that is run over that pothole. It is fixed correctly. At least that pothole that they correct is not going to have to be corrected again the next year. It's not going to wash out. 
And so at least we have taken a step, as, as insignificant as it may seem, to at least fix what we can and fix it right and do the best that we can with the money that we have. One of the things that I was, uh, when people have complained to me about, we have this truck and we've had it for a year and no one can drive it, uh, I think part of the planning uh, that should go into things like this are that uh, when you purchase the truck that you do make sure that you have people to drive it and also that you have the funds to buy the materials to uh, fill the patches and I understand that is a problem. Uh, I don't know, uh, again, this is one of the things that I have heard that uh, we'll have to budget for that. It was not included in the last budget that we have money to buy the supplies. But once we get this all together, then we should have good buttholes uh, filled. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we don't have, you know, fixing the roads was pointed out that by the public works director that before we completely resurface roads that we do need to fix underneath the infrastructure, the sewers and all that because uh, no sooner than we resurface the roads then we will have to dig them up because of the uh, old pipes that will eventually break. So yeah, patching them is the way to go until we can get the money to fix them. Properly. Uh, I'll just say real quick, I uh, I was in the council meetings when they approved the truck, it was unanimous, and I think our city council acted in a means reflective of information they were given at that time. I fully supported them in that decision they made. Uh, they could only vote in how they were told. They, were, they, did, they weren't told that no one could drive the truck. They weren't told that it wasn't budgeted to buy material to fix the potholes. They made a decision based on what they were told the equipment could do and the need to fix some potholes in the street for the citizens, and that's what they did, and it was the right decision. Now we go back because of the things they didn't know and working to get those done. And I think a patch is a patch. It's not a permanent repair, but it will be a means to do something to get some of the potholes fixed and get them in the right direction so we can get like we talked about, plans in place, capital reserve built, and start looking long term at the major problem. The next question, coming back to this idea of needing to work together to accomplish the goals we have for Van Alstein, what thoughts do you have for improvements within the EDC, the Economic Development Corporation, and the CDC, the Community Development Corporation? I worked a little bit with, with EDC while I was here um, a few years ago, and I know that you know both of these institutions could could certainly do more with with additional um, community input. But what specifically do you have ideas on to, to strengthen either EDC, CDC, or both? And for this one, could we start with Mr. S I, as I said before, there's a tremendous amount of money that goes to the EDC and the CDC. A quarter percent of our sales tax each month goes to goes to each one of those entities. percent. <coughs> a lot of money is spent on just maintaining a storefront with salaries and rent and utilities and that sort of thing. A lot of their budget goes just to that. I would like to find a way to incorporate those two into the into the city and use that funding to have a full-time economic developer, to have a professional that goes out, like, like uh, we talked about before, about going to Canada, drawing companies in, being more proactive on the on drawing people in instead of reactive when somebody gets here and talks about building a business and or having a business in Van Alstein. I'd like for our city manager to take that issue and evaluate it and let him bring recommendations to the council on how that money could be spent more effectively than it has been in the past. I don't know enough about either the CDC or the EDC to comment on it. I'm sorry that that's just not in my uh, area of expertise, so I, 
I have no comment. Okay, fair enough. I too do not have a lot of knowledge about CDC and EDC. Uh, no names of some people who serve on those committees do not know of anyone really personally. Uh, just knowing some of the facts that I'm hearing from Mr. Smith, if, if those entities are drawing a quarter percent of our tax revenue, uh, I would like to see more results than, than I have seen just from the side in the means of, like I referred to earlier, is AutoZone, uh, Brookshires. There should be some businesses coming in. I think the city should challenge these two groups to go out and promote and get those people in here. I know a little bit about uh, EDC and CDC, uh, not a whole bunch to really talk 15-20 uh, uh, minutes about, but uh, you know with your EDC, how many of you people know what really goes on? Do they ever communicate with the citizens of Val Austin about what they're doing? You never hear anything until you say, hey, the EDC just bought 16 acres of land and gave it to metal industries. Comes out in the newspaper. The newspaper knows about it before the citizens of Van Austin. So my theory of this is, is your EDC is to bring, bring businesses to the city. Your CDC has got money set aside to maybe put some bleachers in your parks and stuff like this. Uh, and I believe the CDC has uh, invested some money in some of our parks and, and for that we have some nice parks. But as far as the EDC, we never know where that money's going, the tax money, until it comes out in the newspaper that we bought 16 acres of land. So I mean, I think that the citizens ought to be made aware of what uh, EDC and CDC both are doing. And uh, I think that the EDC needs to work real close with the uh, city manager. Like I uh, said earlier, your Chamber of Commerce is another avenue that can help bring businesses to the city of Van Alstein. So we can't just pick on EDC and CDC and all of this. We need to put everybody together and get those businesses to town. But I would like to know what's on the minds of uh, EDC and CDC before it goes to the newspaper. So we'll close on a question that has to do with other communities and what they're up to. Is there a community that you feel is doing things better than Van Alstine? If so, which one? And have you contacted their leadership to find out what they're doing differently? And this one will start with Ms. Toyberg. I know of a few that I wouldn't want to go to, <laughs> but I'm not aware of anyone that's doing anything better than Van Alstine. You know, we have our problems, but I think uh, we do try to work together to solve them, and like I said, things are progressing now, so I don't see uh, any of the other communities around that I would want to move to or uh, be a, a part of, so I'm going to say no, there's no, I have not contacted anyone else, nor have I considered uh, a move to, or a uh, change. Okay, thank you. Mr. I, if you look at the communities doing something better, uh, in defining better, I wouldn't say better, uh, I would say maybe they're doing things a little smarter. Um, it's not that we don't have the capabilities to grow, it's just a matter of having promoted them. It's a matter of having been approached. Um, what I live in, how or, 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 or Anna, you know, I'm happy here in Van Austin. I think we need, as I've said before, we need to promote what we have, we need to do it better, and we need to do it smarter. Well, I moved uh, from McKinney, Texas here. And I wouldn't move back to McKinney for it, okay? So I'm very happy in the city of Van Alstein. I have been for the last 40 years. Uh, there's not a city around that, that I could compare uh, our fine city to, okay? Uh, and I don't want to live in Anna, don't want to live in McKinney, don't want to live in Fairview, because they got potholes too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, 
there's not a city around that, that I could compare Van Alstine to. You know, when you walk down the street in the city of Van Alstine, people talk to you. How are you this morning? Walk down the streets of Atlanta, Texas and see how many does that for you. They're not there. The people in Howe don't reach you like the people in Van Alstine does. So uh, we have a, f a fine city here. And uh, there's not a city that I want to compare Van Alstine to. So what we need to do is be ourselves, be our own city. And you know, let's don't compare Van Alstine to Anna, Whitesboro. I've heard uh, people compare uh, city employees salaries to Whitesboro, McKinney, Garland. Wow, let's be Van Alstine. Let's pay the price that we need to pay and let everybody else worry about their prices. And no, I wouldn't trade Van Alstine for any of these cities that I have mentioned. Thank you. To Thank avoid. You. I hope my obituary says that a resident of, that I died as a resident of Van Alstine, you're not going to get rid of me that easy. I'm staying here. I have a chance uh, through my business as, as regular customers of council members that come from other towns, Anna, Hal, Gunner, White Wright, they, they all come in, we, we share notes, we compare notes to, on, on what's going on in their town, what's going on in our town, and I try to make note of those that, that, are, that, that have value, that, that compare. I agree with Robert, we're unique, we have our own problems. Some that are similar to other towns, but some that are unique to Van Alstine. Every time I hear some another council member talking about their problems and their issues, I think, wow, we just, we just thought it was bad here. There's, there's always a town that has something worse going on than, than, than what we have. I try to take those comments that I hear from, from other council members and jot them down, send an email to our city manager and say, here's, here's a thought for you. Put it into your mix and see how you can combine it with, with other information that you have. I think it's great to interact with other cities and uh, to hear what they have going and, and their problems and their solutions and share them with us and let us take those and, and put them together and collectively try to tackle the problems we have. Uh, but before I, I relinquish my, my responsibilities as moderator, I just want to say a few uh, thank yous. Of course, to the Chamber of Commerce to, to allowing this event to happen and for organizing it and for um, having us to, to help in its uh, operation. Thank you to the candidates for spending, I'm sure, um, what you would maybe rather be doing, but you're, you're coming here to answer questions and, and get to know the community that you're hoping to represent. I'd also like to thank the audience members. Uh, for coming. You're, you're doing a, a tremendous service just learning about the, the candidates and helping yourselves uh, to, to make a better informed decision in your voting. And on that note, I'd like to, to remind folks that early voting is April 30th in the City Hall. Okay, so April 30th is early voting. The main voting is in the Community Center on May 12th. And I'd like to leave you with a couple of quotes to just motivate you, uh, not only yourselves to vote, but to try to get others also to express their opinions in a vote. Uh, I look to quotes for some wisdom because I'm sometimes lacking it. So these <laughs> are, are ones that I particularly liked about the responsibility we have as citizens to vote. The first one goes like this. To make democracy work, we must be a nation of participants, not simply observers. One who does not vote has no right to complain. And another, vote, uh, another uh, quote about voting was, bad officials are elected by good citizens who do not vote. So with that, uh, I say thank you to everyone again, and let's uh, have 30 minutes in the lobby for a personal meeting. The, the president of the chamber would like to say a couple words. Just quickly, I wanted to thank everyone again for coming tonight. Thank you to the candidates for coming and answering the questions. Um, thanks to the audience. I know all of you out there are voters, um, and um, clearly you have a lot of interest in the community. Wanted to um, tell you also that, in case you haven't heard, 
Um, we are, the Chamber of Commerce is going to have a huge event towards the end of this year in October. It's the Art and Antiques Fair, and it is going to be held in the downtown area. We are, we've been meeting on it since the beginning of the year, and we are promoting the city of Van Alstine to everybody we can talk to. So um, you'll be hearing a lot of more about it in um, the days to come. Thank you all again for coming, and I hope you enjoy the cookies and coffee and drinks out in the front talk of the candidates.